Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, our last session on Panel True uh, on sustainable production uh, towards circular economy. Uh, in this fourth session, we will talk about energy and material efficiency along the value chain. Uh, I'm Simone Zanoni. I came from University of Brescia, where I'm a professor in industrial system and uh, uh, I've done research on this uh, topic uh, regarding especially the supply chain impact on energy efficiency uh, from uh, several years uh, right now and joined with uh, uh, Andrea, uh, I will chair this uh, session. I will introduce uh, the uh, presenter while Andrea will uh, help me in uh, posing the questions to the, the presenters. Uh, as I said, we will have uh, five presentation. The first presentation uh, will be provided uh, via uh, a video. So unfortunately, Anna has a huge uh, task to perform and since uh, he has registered the video uh, of, his present of her presentation, uh, then uh, uh, we will uh, see her video uh, directly right now. That is on BAT benchmarking tools for industry. Uh, we have some issue with the audio. Uh, let's try again to launch again the presentation. Of course, I encourage all the presenters to put the questions uh, at least over resource efficient decision making tools for. It comes as no surprise to anyone present here today that industry is responsible for more than one third of the total greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, in 2017, emissions from the industrial sectors surpassed the 3.5 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. And yet, despite the scale of industrial emissions, public debate and policies have been mostly focused on efficiency improvements in other sectors, namely transport. Additionally, when improvement strategies for industry are debated, they tend to focus solely on energy efficiency options. But in industrial processes, the flows of input materials and energy interact throughout chemical reactions to generate the desired product, resulting in an upgrade in material quality and a consequent downgrade in energy quality. So when assessing efficiency improvements for industry, looking only at the energy efficiency potential or the material efficiency potential provides a skewed vision of the full potential for improvement. That's where the concept of resource efficiency comes to play. It includes the integrated assessment of the material and energy flow fed into the process to produce useful products. And what my research and the research that has been conducted at the Resource Efficiency Collective is trying to find is precisely if resource efficiency can be used as a simple quantitative physical metric that allows to assess and benchmark industrial performance across sectors and fields. Here is my lovely group, which has been investigating the use of resource efficiency for a couple of years. Previous works included the use of a resource-efficient ecstasy-based metric in real-time operations using data still basic oxygen still making plant as a case study, which was then extended to the analysis of comprehensive resource data on the global steel industry, mapping the average resource flow across 38 plants worldwide. Exergy, as an integrated energy and material flow metric, was also used in the study of an ammonia site and steam methane reforming plant. The main conclusions we drawn from these studies were that the use of an exergy based metric allowed for the integration of energy and material flows into one single dimensionless metric, thus enabling the comparisons between 
plants, technology, and sectors, and reflecting the quality of resources and allowing to determine the streams that are worth recovering. However, the use of real-time operation data, what we can define as a bottom-up approach, is extremely data and intensive and time consuming, facing often the reluctance of company side requiring the signing of NDAs and data confidentiality agreements. And although the use of real-time operational data gives important insight to plant level operators, less detailed information is required to inform higher level management, regulators and policymakers on the performance of a given plant and sector. In a sense, my PhD seeks to understand what the minimal amount of data is for the determination of resource efficiencies for a plant, a sector or an industry. In particular, I'm trying to understand if it is possible to determine the best practice resource efficiency using data reported to collection schemes and whether such value can be used to benchmark environmental performances. As a case study, I consider the production of clinker in Europe. Using data from the European Commission's uh, best available technology reference documents, also known as BREFs, I model what would be the best available technology planned for clinker manufacturing and perform mass, energy, and exergy flow analysis to the four most energy intensive processes in order to determine the best uh, resource efficiency. Clinker offers a particular interesting case because complete carbonization of the process is impossible since CO2 is released during clinkerization. So in order to reduce emissions from this type of manufacturing, we must look at resource efficiency options. The BAT plant for clinical production uses a dry process rig with four to six stage breeder and recalciner, and the four processes that I studied with the raw mill, the multi-stage pre-eater, the clinker burning process, which includes both the precalciner and the kiln, and the clinker cooling. The data required for the analysis included the type of operation, the composition, the temperature and pressure of the flows, and the energy demand of each equipment. From those, the material balance of the flows were performed, and the exergetic balances too align for the determination of the useful products and losses within each piece of equipment. Here you can see for the raw mill, the preheater, the clinker burning processes, and the clinker cooling. It was found that resource efficiency of the four processes varied between 65 and 7 percent, which is a lot, with the, less, with the less efficient process being the clinker burning, which we were expecting, since the clinker burning uh, has the bigger temperature differences. On the whole, we found that the use of exergy-based resource efficiency methodology clearly highlighted the processes where the biggest improvement potential existed, where useful work in exergy was being lost. We believe that the incorporation of the proposed methodology in the construction of the BREF documents through best practice resource efficiency values can help to overcome the current skewed vision of the, they present towards energy efficiency and emissions target values, overlooking the impact of material efficiency strategies on industrial emissions. Although additional information was required regarding the allocation of electricity flows to each of the processes being assessed, the majority of the data needed was available in the BREFs. For that reason, the inclusion of this metric in the BREFs would not represent a significant additional effort in terms of reporting and collection. From the results obtained so far, it is clear that the device methods for top-down analysis of industrial processes provided a good proxy for sectorial best practice resource efficiency, which can be used as a useful metric for decision-making tool at managerial, policy-making, and investment levels. Providing an analysis of energy and material flows under a single dimensionless unit, the adoption of resource efficiency exergy based metric for the determination of best practice resource efficiency in the construction of the BREFs would allow for benchmarking plants and even sectors performance. So in the future, what we intend to do is to apply this methodology to a larger set of the different emission intensive industry sectors already covered by the BREFs and also investigating its acceptability and the equity uh, of best of practice resource efficiency as a metric for directing strategic sustainable investment. 
once again, thank you for listening to me and for having me today in your panel. I'm sorry I couldn't join you uh, at the time, but um, any questions that you have, I'll be very glad to uh, answer them. So please do not hesitate to contact me using my email. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Anna, for the presentation. Of course, uh, you can provide question over Uva or directly to, the, to Anna on her uh, email address. The second presentation uh, will be provided by uh, Marcus Fritz, uh, that is uh, uh, research associate at the Fraunhofer Institute and uh, will be uh, still on exergy analysis. Please, Marcus. Yeah, welcome from my side. Um, it's really interesting because maybe a little spoiler alert, we did what Anna just mentioned in her last slide. So we will, or I will talk today about uh, the topic, the energy of exergy um, and about the analysis of different olefin production routes. And yeah, as you saw before, this might be a little bit of a, of a bulky topic, but I promise you, I, I will not bore you with physical formulas. So please stay with me and, and we will get to it. So my goal is for today um, that you all understand what are the benefits of XG analysis and maybe we can then discuss in the end what you think about the usefulness or yeah, what do you think about it. So let's start with a short agenda. Um, I will give you a short background why the petrochemical sector is, is, is relevant and, and why we did what we did. Um, then I will present you some data and method, our production processes, which we analyzed. I will present you our method and then end with some results, a uh, short discussion and, and the conclusion. So let's jump right into the background. I think we had yesterday already a presentation about the petrochemical sector. So the people who were there already know about the relevance of the sector and maybe for everyone else. Um, the petrochemical sector is responsible for around 7% of worldwide CO2 emissions and 10% of the worldwide final energy demand. So you see, it's very important to decarbonize the sector in order to achieve our climate goals. So how can we do this? We have different opportunities. One opportunity could be to use the remaining efficiency potential, but what we should say here is that the, the current process, the steam cracking process is really established and um, there were a lot of improvements in the last years. So there's not so many efficiency potentials left. And maybe another way to decarbonize the sector is uh, the introduction of new production processes. And because of that, um, currently there are different production processes for, for the future production of olefins presented in literature. And that was our starting point and that we wanted to analyze these different production processes and compare them with the current process. As um, Anna said before, Today, the specific energy consumption is often used as an indicator for efficiency. And however, we have other aspects which should all also be taken into account. Um, for example, for industries like the petrochemical sector in which energy carriers are used both energetically and materially, a purely energetic analysis isn't enough. So it's really important to also look at the material efficiency and the, and the material pers uh, perspective. And um, maybe another thing, we are all here in, in this panel about circular economy. So the increasing material efficiency within processes is also of great importance and, and, and really, really crucial to, to achieve our, our climate goals. So what could be a solution for, for this topic? And I will present you today a solution and yeah, you, you already know it. Um, the solution could be exergy. So what, what is Exergy? So Exergy offers an, a, a, an evaluation tool to consider the energetic as well as the material efficiency of processes. And for that, um, yeah, you need to, uh, to uh, assign inputs and outputs to all of the production processes. And then you can, can build on this, um, yeah, an, an, an Exergy analysis, but I will come to that later. 
So what you should take away from the site is just that the exergy is an indicator um, where you can yeah, benchmark the overall process um, with a combination of energy efficiency and material efficiency. So let's jump into the first production process. Um, as I said before, we, we looked at um, the current production process. It's the steam cracking process. And there are three major steps in this process. The first step is the, the pyrolysis. And there, um, the, the raw materials, the input, um, it's in the most cases, it's NAFTA, um, is cracked in a steam cracker in, into cracked gas. Then in the second step, we have there the primary um, fractionation where the cracked gas is quenched to avoid secondary reactions and then cooled down to ambient temperature in cooling towers. And during this process, there are, there's the primary fractionation where the first fractions are separated. And then the third step is the product fractionation, um, yeah, where the cracked gas is, is fractionated into the final products. In our case, um, the, the, the olefins. So the first future production process uh, we looked at, in, in total, we looked at two future production processes. And the first one is olefin production with, with waste to methanol and methanol to olefins. And you can see here a flow chart. Um, there are two main steps. And maybe let's start here with the second part because it is identical with the other uh, future production process. We have there the production process of methanol to olefins, where methanol is the main input with a little bit or with electricity. And as an output, we have there olefins and flugas and other yeah, byproducts. And now the question is, okay, where we get the methanol from? And one possibility is the production of methanol out of waste. Um, their waste um, is, is gasified, and then you can produce methanol out, out of waste after a few steps of purifying and um, separation. But what should be mentioned here is that it's not classic municipal waste, Sondern it's, uh, in this case, it's RDF. It's refused derived fuel, so it's already prepared waste, and the composition of the waste is really crucial for this process. So let's look into the second future production process uh, we analyzed. It's the process of um, olefin production with methanol synthesis and methanol to olefins. As I said before, the, um, the, second, the second part of the, um, of the process is identical to the first one. And um, now we get the methanol from another source. <coughs> Um, and this is the synthesis of methanol out of CO2 and hydrogen. So you can make methanol out of CO2 and hydrogen with, um, yeah, with electricity. And the main input here is electricity. We see later um, because of the, the electrolyzers. So let's have a look um, in, at, at our method, um, how we, uh, conduct our, our study. As you saw in the previous slides, we, we analyzed um, the, the different steps that we analyzed um, the, the, uh, the, the sub-processes with inputs and outputs. So we prepared um, a mass balance. The slides are a little bit not right, but yeah, I think it should work okay. So um, yeah, as I said before, we, we prepare a mass balance for the incoming and outgoing material flows. And for this, we use literature data. And for the current production process for the steam cracker, we used the, the BREF document, as Anna mentioned before, for the cement industry. We did this for the petrochemical sector, for the, the olefin production, um, also with the BREF document. And the others are also taken from literature. The second step is the calculation of the exergies of the substances. Um, for that, we assign an exergy value to each of the incoming and outgoing materials. And these exergetic values are uh, based on their chemical and physical properties. 
Then in the third step, we prepare the exergy uh, balances. And for that, we first look at the exergetic inputs, and then in the second step, the exergetic outputs. And for the outputs, we then assign these exergy flows that leaving the process to three different categories, uh, to the categories usage, internal, and external losses. And the usage is, is straightforward. The usage is just the sum of the, the, the physical and, and, and chemical exergy of the products produced. So the, the um, exergy of, of the olefins. And um, our external losses are classified as the output of the, ex uh, the, the, the exergy of the output flows that do not represent a product. So everything we produced, but that is not used in the current um, production process. And th these are, for example, flu gases or wastewater or, or ashes. And then the third one uh, are, are the internal losses. And the internal losses are just calculated by, by solving this, this equation here. And then our fourth step um, is yeah, a comparison of the exit uh, G balances of the different uh, production processes. So let's jump right into the results. We have here um, the results of the, 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 the steam cracking process. And you see here on the left side, we have the exergetic inputs. And these are mainly here the material NAFTA and the, the energetic NAFTA and yeah, a little bit of air. And on the right side, uh, there are um, uh, the outputs. And as I said before, we have uh, three major outputs. We have the ex exergetic usage, which are our products, um, the external losses, which are flue gas, water, and ash, and then the internal losses are just calculated by, by solving the equation. Our first future production process is the waste to methanol process. And uh, here you see it is, um, the main input is here, the refuse derived fuel. And what, what is interesting about the exergy analysis here is that we have here this big value of exergetic input um, from, from this refuse derived fuel. And when we just would conduct an energy efficiency analysis, then this would be much less uh, or yeah, uh, yeah, much smaller because we then just um, take into account the energetic part of the RDF and not the material part. And the outcome is, is yeah, it's quite similar to the steam cracking process. And then our second future production process, it's the CO2 and uh, hydrogen synthesis to methanol and methanol to, to olefins. And there we have um, this big input electricity and this um, yeah, is, is, is mainly because of the electrolyzers that we need a lot of electricity to produce hydrogen out of the water and also need a little bit of electricity uh, to, to produce the olefins out of, out of the methanol. So let's compare these results now. Here you see a table with our indicators. We have for the steam cracking process an exergy efficiency of around 56%. For the waste to methanol process, an exergy efficiency of around 54%. And for the CO2 and, and uh, hydrogen synthesis and methanol tolefins, an exergy efficiency of around 50%. So we can see that the exergetic efficiency uh, are at a similar level. <coughs> Sorry. And from an exergetic point of view, um, none of the processes have really high advantages over the others. So we should not discard one of them and maybe use other indicators to choose what is the best future production process. So let's come to a discussion and conclusion. First of all, I would say that the measure of exergy efficiency, the interpretation of the results is quite difficult because you have there this indicator and you know, okay, I know what is my exergy efficiency, but what to do now with this. And the problem here is that you, yeah, you, you, you have this theoretical potential, but no concrete potential where to do something or where you can um, 
yeah improve your your process and for that you sh you must really go in in detail and um do an exergy analysis for every sub step of of the um of the process and this is very very data intensive so another point uh, the results depends on the system boundaries as i said before um for example the the production of hydrogen uh, we said that we produce the hydrogen on site but it could also be one possibility to use the uh, to to produce the the um, the hydrogen offsite, and then you wouldn't need that much electricity. And so, yeah, it it depends really on the system boundaries. What what is your um, exergy efficiency? Then maybe one point about our analysis: we analyze typical plants, not real plants. So that was our approach that we use the literature data and not real plants data. Um, maybe three more points. Uh, all in all, the exergy efficiency analysis helps to identify unused efficiency potentials. And one big advantage is that it takes into account the material and the um, energetic values. So it helps for, for evaluation of processes with the material use of high exergetic value, for example, NAFTA or RDF. So especially for the chemical industry, this is a really advantage over the um, energy efficiency because you also use these um, material things, for example, NAFTA, and yeah, that, that, that's a yeah, big advantage over the energy um, efficiency analysis. And then one point about our analysis, uh, as I mentioned before, the waste composition is crucial for the process as it's not municipal waste, it's, it's RDF. And then one last point, um, as I said, the exergetic analysis show the theoretical potential, but no concrete potential for optimization or improvement. So all in all, we could say that for the selection of the future processes, um, therefore we, we cannot choose one of our, the future production processes out of our analysis. So we would suggest to, to search for the dialogue with industry and, and do some road mapping approaches for, um, yeah, for choosing the right future production processes. So thank you for listening. Um, our institute is, is cut out now, but yeah, just thank you. I hope that um, maybe I, I could uh, give you an introduction in, into the exergy. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting approach. So maybe the question also to you, what do you think about um, the, the exergetic analysis? Do you think it's useful or would you suggest to stay, uh, to stay with separate, uh, separated energetic analysis and material analysis? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for your interesting presentation and uh, very well connected with the ANA presentation. Uh, we know that the uh, practitioners that uh, who think about using exergy uh, uh, to analyze the energy processes is increasing, uh, but as you said, there are still some points that need to be properly uh, considered. That is, first of all, uh, you can, uh, uh, in using exergy analysis, you can quantify thermodynamic losses, uh, but actually you cannot uh, really understand uh, uh, the value of these uh, losses. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the, the matter of uh, boundaries is very, is very relevant. Uh, putting uh, boundaries in a different way or encountering, for example, for your uh, cases, different energy sources uh, uh, may uh, require probably a lot of attention otherwise uh, uh, the, the, the interpretation uh, uh, may be mis misleading. Uh, okay, I, I think uh, that I can leave the floor for the questions. Uh, Andrea, shall please yeah. go ahead with the questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Marcus, for your presentation. And we already have a fundamental question from Matthias. So he's asking why uh, exergy efficiency is a relevant number for judging the processes in the context of climate change. Yeah, uh, thank you for this. I, I think uh, Simone just um, just said it before. It's it's a measure where you can define the, the thermodynamical system and you can then yeah, see what, what is the theoretical potential. 
Um, but yeah, as, as mentioned before, it's really def difficult or it's, it's not so easy to interpret, uh, to interpret these, these results. So if you do it correct and you have your, your sub processes and you go really in detail, then it can help you to, to identify um, yeah, efficiency potentials, especially with, with this point that you can, can look at the energy efficiency and the material efficiency part. Okay, thank you very much. And then he has another question on the waste sources, which would be available for this uh, waste to methanol process? And are there competing things in the future? Yeah, that, that's a really difficult question. We, we talked or we discussed a lot about um, over this because um, this process, I said before, it, it, it depends really on the composition of, of the waste. And um, for this, there is a specific composition, but it's not so far away from our um, municipal waste today. But what should be mentioned here is that in, in this composition, there is a lot of plastic and it's, we, we don't know if we have in, in the future that huge amount of plastic in our municipal waste. So maybe this could be a problem in, in the future um, because yeah, you, you need um, the, this carbon source. And if there's, there's no plastic or no, no wood in, in, the, in the waste, then you would have a problem. Okay, thank you very much. And then we have one additional question from uh, Thomas Bjorkman. Uh, have you made an analysis with the system limit, including surrounding industries and buildings? because they see a possibility to establish a new energy intensive operations that make this analysis jointly. Um, yeah, in, in uh, this, this presentation or this paper is, is an outcome of a project. And in this project, we also looked at um, industrial symbiosis uh, possibilities. But um, yeah, the thing there was that we just looked at different industries and they are all far away from, from each other. And then we conducted um, an analysis with also including the losses along the, the flow paths and the, the, yeah, the ways there were over 100 kilometers. And then it doesn't make sense to, to combine um, there these industries, but in industry parks, yeah, that, that might be very interesting to look at at it, but um, we, we didn't uh, do that. So, yeah. Uh, do we have time for a final question? Maybe. Yeah. No? Yeah. Yes, yes, very quick one. Okay. Yes. okay, good. Then there is just the final question. If you have a gut feeling, uh, how would biomass gasification to methanol compare to what you've showed? Um, yeah, that, that's also a, a very interesting point that could be another um, future production process. And I, I think that it might be in the, um, yeah, in the level of the waste to methanol process. So it could be also a supply option to produce methanol. But yeah, as I, as I said, I, I think it's very important to discuss this with, um, with the industry. And biomass is, is a very special topic. And I think there are other experts um, yeah, we would, would, who, who can lead this discussion. Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the role of biomass in our future energy system is, is not so clear today. OK, thank you very much. I think we, we uh, finish here and then uh, go on with the next presenter. Thank you. Okay, the third presentation, I know quite well this presentation since uh, uh, I'm a co-author. Uh, actually, this is on uh, uh, the presentation on uh, food and beverage sector on cold chain. We had the presentation uh, on cement, one on petrochemical, and then we will have uh, steel and aluminum. But of course, uh, uh, food uh, plays uh, or represent a very important aspect of our, our uh, daily life. Uh, and uh, uh, the approach uh, uh, or the value chain approach and the supply chain approach is a central part of an European project uh, uh, that uh, uh, specifically uh, Lisa from Fraunhofer uh, is presenting some uh, outcomes uh, of uh, this uh, behavioral and uh, uh, 
uh, non-energy benefits uh, uh, appreciation. Lisa, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simone. I hope you can hear me well. Um, um, yeah, not, so um, now that we learned from Marcus and Anna a lot about um, specifically more efficient production processes, I would like to extend our view um, to whole supply chains and this by considering energy efficiency from farm to fork. So as Simone already mentioned, we use the food industry as example. And um, together with our partner, University of Brescia, we asked ourselves the question, what relevance non-energy benefits and behavioral aspects have on energy efficiency along the coal supply chain? So, yeah. Let's look on energy efficiency um, in the coal supply chain. What does from farm to fork mean is that food products pass on their way in the cold chain through many hands under cooling and all these cooling and freezing processes are important energy end users in the food industry. So it seems that I have the same problems as Marcus had with his presentation. Yeah, but I still I hope you can still read it. Um, well, um, Cooling and freezing are expected to hold a 30% share in the electricity consumption of cross-cutting technologies in the food industry. And it is estimated that about 20% of perishable foods are lost through a lack of refrigeration. So what we traditionally look on energy efficiency is from an individual company perspective. And what was the aim of our study is to shift the perspective from a single company to um, a whole supply chain. Um, for the food industry, this could be, for example, done by thinking about joint deliveries or by harmonizing temperature levels or pooling resources. And just such cross company activities could offer opportunities for energy saving. What now is evaluated in the existing literature, literature for example, of Laurel, um, is non energy are non-energy related benefits. So benefits additionally to the evident energy savings. And they have been identified as important factor for the assessment of such measures. And on the other hand, there's a lot of literature dealing with barriers to the implementation of energy efficiency measures, which names various behavioral and organizational aspects which might impede the adoption of measures. And if you think of the coal supply chain, given their complexity in the food industry, um, those before mentioned behavioral aspects might be even more relevant. So this brings me to our three research questions, um, where we ask firstly, um, to what degree the companies along the coal chain cooperate with each other in terms of energy efficiency. And secondly, we ask what relevance non-energy benefits such such as enhanced competitiveness or um, reduced maintenance um, can have. Here you can see them accord classified according to the existing literature. And the question is how are non-energy benefits perceived along the supply chain as compared to the individual company? And thirdly, the research questions you probably cannot read is um, what behavioral and organizational challenges arise along the supply chain with regard to energy efficiency improvements. So what did we do in our study? Mm, yeah, we, um, to gain first insights into the thinking of energy efficiency, we um, conducted um, in total 61 semi-structured stakeholder interviews in 11 countries EU wide with the target group um, uh, were companies from the food industry operating in different stages of the coal supply chain. And the interviews were conducted with representatives from companies with a good knowledge about um, energy and who are familiar with the coal supply chain. What was additionally carried out, carried out afterwards is an online survey, but this won't be a part of this, today's presentation. So in the next slides, I would like to share some of the interview results with you. Um, first of all, yeah, we um, were asking the participants how relevant energy efficiency is in their decision-making processes. And the majority of the 
interviews agree that energy efficiency is relevant and considered in most decisions. Um, also, um, since it's directly related to energy cost savings. And from a single company perspective, um, the participants could name a lot of concrete examples for such energy efficiency measures like improved insulation or closed refrigeration units and retail stores, or also more efficient loading processes at a loading ramp. But when asking the same participants um, to assess the relevance of, non -ener of energy efficiency, uh, from the perspective of the whole coal supply chain, the situation seems a bit different. As you can see here, still nearly 60% of the interviews indicate that in the coal chain, energy efficiency is considered in most or even all decisions. But the larger share states that it's hardly relevant um, or didn't answer the question. So it seems that energy efficiency is presently considered more strongly in the individual companies than an, along entire coal supply chains. And the interviews also reveal that decision-making routines along the entire chain are far from common practice. So as another topic, um, the interviews were asked about the role of non-energy benefits, in particular, if they perceived any positive side effects besides the energy and CO2 savings. Mm, what the results show is that the majority of the individual companies with 75%, as you can see here, associates positive effects to the implemented energy efficiency measures. And when asking the same question for the whole supply chain again, the number of responses is much lower, while the majority still seems to perceive positive effects. But the awareness for NEBs along the chain seems relatively low and the possible impacts difficult to measure for the companies. What we ask in addition um, is to choose um, from a list of non-energy benefits, those two which speak strongest for investing in an energy efficiency measure. So more from a decision maker perspective. And here it is um, confirmed again that the economic advantage of an NEB is a dominating aspect. So for example, increased productivity and automation is considered as most important decision criterion for the uptake of an energy efficiency measure. And this is closely followed by improved operations and working conditions and waste reduction. When it comes to communication, the majority of the interviews agree that some energy is wasted due to a lack of coordination in the cold chain, 72%, as you can see here. And with regard to communication on energy efficiency, the majority points out that there are no activities here in green or that they are even not involved in such communicational activities. And those 38% um, who are involved in energy related communication activities were now asked for um, behavioral challenges with regard to energy efficiency improvements. The next slide um, gives um, an overview about all the various behavioral and organizational challenges um, which were named from the interviewees, which might impede the implementation of energy efficiency measures along the chain. And I would only like to elaborate on a few here. So what you can see in the first column is that one major problem along the chain is that communication often only takes place within the scope of contracts. For example, this is between the quality assurance departments of the producers and their logistic partners. And especially in the logistics sector, this comes along with a lack of coordination and missing transparency along the chain, as you can see in column four. Um, this means that uh, often there is a suboptimal routing or long waiting times of the cooling trucks, trucks who are only, which are only partially loaded due to expected short time deliveries and also warehouses with a non-optimal inventory level. And what comes next is, is are challenges or barriers with regard to resources um, where, where the interviews often mention a lack of skilled personnel, for example, that engineers in the field of refrigeration are missing. What, um, what comes on top is, um, as I already mentioned, the complex structure of the 
the cold chain. So all the different actors in the chain um, with different priorities, different cultural backgrounds, um, as well as varying regulations on country level, um, those barriers might arise as additional challenge um, for, the, for the chain. So um, coming to an end, I would like to um, summarize my results or our results. Um, what the findings from the interview suggest is that energy efficiency is presently considered more strongly in the individual companies than along entire coal supply chains and that awareness regarding non-energy benefits along the chain seems relatively low and um, possible impacts also difficult to measure for the companies. And there are various behavioral aspects which may impede an easy implementation of an energy efficiency measure. And the complexity of the cold chain, especially in the food industry, um, yeah, is, plays a, a major role with regard to behavioral challenges. So at the end, I would like to give a brief outlook with regard to some policy recommendations. Um, first of all, strengthening the information exchange along the chain seems to be really important. Um, this should be done on a more regular basis. And um, one example could be um, by adapting the concept of energy efficiency networks, as some of my colleagues um, yesterday presented. Um, yeah, adapting this concept to whole coal supply chains and bringing all the actors on a table for, for exchanging on the, those topics. And another thing is spreading technical to solutions um, for optimize, optimization, especially in the logistics sector. And uh, yeah, finally, tailored funding schemes for cross-company measures could be helpful as well as introducing decision support models where also aspects like non-energy benefits are included. So as Simone already mentioned, um, those interviews I presented you today were conducted within the framework of the Horizon 2020 project IC. And first of all, I would like to thank all partners for realizing the interviews and all the participants for sharing their insights with us. And um, finally, I want to thank you for your attention. So happy to receive your questions. Thank you very much, Lisa, for the presentation. Uh, just one uh, observation regarding, or if you want to uh, give some clue on the upcoming, uh, or first of all, uh, if you should invite uh, the audience uh, uh, to connect uh, to, the, to, the, to the project website, uh, and maybe just uh, giving some clue on the upcoming uh, also benchmarking model uh, that will be provided through the next steps of the project, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so yeah, there are a lot of um, plans within our project um, where we want to facilitate um, small and medium enterprises in the cold chain to undertake energy efficiency measures. And for example, all the results um, with regard to non-energy benefits and the, the survey and interview results will um, flow into a benchmarking tool where the companies um, can benchmark themselves and, and, and see how active they are in comparison to, to others, other actors in the chain. But this is only one, one, one tool of, of a whole tool complex within the project um, where we really want to um, yeah, take a look at the supply chain, also the energy consumption in, in the supply chain, as you can um, think that there is often a trade-off between energy consumption and um, food quality, which needs to be preserved, um, which is an, the most important aspect for the cold chain. And there we have some tools to analyze the life cycle of such products of the cold chain and all the different stages in the cold chain. So hopefully um, all the participants in our project and the companies um, afterwards will be more aware of energy efficiency and non-energy benefits. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, let give me the floor to Andrea for asking questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. And you already have three questions. So the first question was, if you could uh, identify further non-energy benefits when dealing with integration of the cold chain. Mm -hmm. It has been from Felipe. Oh, okay, thank you, Felipe. Um, yeah, so 
um, the interviews reveal that it's quite hard for, for the companies to think beyond their individual company boundary, but more along entire supply chains. But of course, they could see, see benefits like um, if they optimize the, the, the transportation and the, and the loading of the trucks that it, it can, of course, um, save some, some gasoline, but it, it also saves um, like organizational costs. Um, it, 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 it saves energy in terms that, that cooling doors are not open too long and products are delivered in time. Um, so um, there seems to be a lot of potential um, um, in particular when we talk with the logistic companies. Mm -hmm. And so this directly leads to the next question because you said there are different aspects and it, it sounds rather complicated and Matthias is asking how you, do you have an idea to how these impacts of non-energy benefits could be better reflected when we evaluate technology options, mm -hmm. for example, via a model-based approach? Um, yeah, I think quantifying NEBs is always a um, difficult topic. Um, when I think from a company perspe perspective, I would say um, some, some easy models for them, decision support models where they, they, they just first can choose from kind of a list of NEBs which might be relevant for them and try to quantify them. Um, that might be that, that um, there are less workers who are who are ill due to better um, working environments and this reflects in, in monetary advantage at the end. Um, so, so I think that must be really easy models um, for the companies to, to first get in touch with this kind of topic because the first what they have in their head is energy cost savings and, and, and secondly there might be such a topic like non-energy benefits. Um, of course, from a scientific view, yeah, that could be quite more complex models. Um, but I think, yeah, to address the companies, we should take it easy there. Mm. So maybe this leads to, to the next question, which, which seems more important in this uh, supply chain. So how can information sharing and transparency transparency happen in such chains. Mm. Is blockchain a good approach or are there other options? Well, as I mentioned before, I think bringing all the actors to a, to a table or some, some online conference would, would be helpful. So um, because we, we made the experience that they even don't know each other. So they know their direct neighbors probably and the neighbors of their neighbors, but they don't know all the members of their cold supply chain. So. Um, this should be the first step um, um, to, to enhance the communication um, within the chain, I think. Um, and um, yeah, because we are in, involved in, in those energy efficiency networks, this could be a, a nice platform, I think, um, where, where, where companies could exchange. But um, I think there are a lot of possibilities at the end. Um, um, of course, all the associations also have some forums where they talk about this kind of topic, but this could be even, yeah, on a more regular basis and, um, um, yeah, have more prior to, uh, more prior to, to other topics, maybe. Yeah. So you say more important than blockchain is just get to know each other and talk to each other. So this is the first step and then we can talk about more sophisticated approaches. Mm -hmm. That would be my impression um, for, from, from the interviews. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but happy to, to hear other <laughs> opinions on that. So at least there are no other comments in the question and answer session. So if there are nothing, nothing pops up and it looks like this, then I would hand over to Simone again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. Uh, now we come back again to material, uh, in particularly the next presentation that will be provided by Alice. Alice. Uh, Gary, if uh, UK steel sector is concentrated on the UK steel sector. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, I'm Alice Garvey, I'm from the University of Leeds in the UK um, and I'm part of the Centre for Research into Energy Demand Solutions. Um, 
And so I'll be presenting some of the results of our uh, steel sector scenario modelling, specifically looking at technology and material efficiency scenarios. Um, so the objectives of the research, going forward a bit too fast. Um, so the first objective was to look at the potential decarbonisation from existing and future technology options in the UK steel sector, um, and looking at the potential um, uh, cumulative uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And the second objective involved evaluating the potential from material efficiency to close mitigation gaps uh, for net zero compatible steel emissions. And this would be in line with the UK's recently legislated um, 2050 net zero target. So I'll pro first provide some context for the mitigation of steel emissions in the UK um, before outlining some of the mitigation strategies we specifically explored in our analysis. Um, I'll then look at our results and present any key findings before suggesting some areas for discussion. So in 2016, uh, the emissions of the iron and steel sector represented 12% of UK industrial emissions. And whilst on an economy-wide basis, the UK's production emissions have been steadily falling, um, there's more volatility in the emissions of the steel sector. Um, and so this is in large part due to the small number of sites. So plant closures and reduced uh, uh, reductions to production capacity have had a disproportionate effect. Um, and so in 2015, the red car blast furnace site in the northeast closed down and in 2016, uh, Tata Steel reduced capacity at its Port Talbot site in Wales. And so there's a critical need to preserve the strategic and structural capacity um, of, of the steel sector in the UK, given its importance to the renewable supply chain and more broadly to UK industrial strategy. And so the recent announcement of a, a £250 million um, clean steel fund um, gives some indication of the importance that the sector is treated with in the UK. So in 2019, the UK Committee on Climate Change presented a report which outlined two net zero compatible carbon budgets for the steel sector um, by 2050. And so the core scenario in this um, involves low cost and low regret options. And the further ambition scenario involves rapid deployment beyond typical industrial turnover rates. Uh, the scenarios both assume a linear trajectory uh, towards uh, residual emissions in 2050. And in the core scenario, this stands at 6.1 megatons of, of CO2 equivalent, um, involving a reduction of 51% from 2018 levels. In the further ambition scenario, uh, residuals on uh, 0.7 megatons of CO2 equivalent, uh, representing a reduction of 94%. So in both cases, you can see there's a substantial um, degree of decarbonisation, which is assumed. So the residual emissions um, the CCC outlined don't actually represent the current um, sectoral share of industrial emissions. So um, this is currently 12%. And this is because the CCC scenarios assume some reallocation of the share of residual emissions uh, to sectors with harder to abate process emissions like cement. And they also assume the allocation of CCS removal capacity to those sorts of sectors. And so here I've outlined what the linear reductions would need to be if the sector achieved its um, designated carbon budgets and also in the dotted line where if the steel sector maintained the same share of its industrial emissions by 2050. And so in this case the cumulative carbon budgets in the uh, maintained sector share which is the dotted line case uh, from 2018 to 2050 at uh, both ambition levels are four percent higher and so this underlines the importance of the budgetary assumptions uh, that's been made towards net zero. Don't know if that's moving forward. <laughs> not moving. Great. Um, okay, so in our analysis, we considered four key technology scenarios um, to establish technical potential for decarbonising the sector. And each um, scenario was modelled at three different ambition levels. Uh, so the retrofit case was modelled using data from the usable energy database, uh, which is a project from the University of Bath. Um, and this provided key data on specific energy consumption values, as well as expected commercialisation dates and uptake rates. Um, the best practice scenario looked at the effect of reaching best practice energy intensity by varied dates. And the fuel shift scenario looked at the effect of a transition to electrified production through conversion uh, to electric arc furnaces over blast furnace, black, basic oxygen furnace steel making. And so in 2017, the share of um, EAF steel making in the UK was about 20%. So this represents uh, there, there could be future scope for greater conversion. And so the novel technology scenario looked at the effects of implementing relatively new technology in the sector, again using data from the UED. 
And so we also looked at a range of uh, material efficiency, efficiency strategies. It doesn't seem to be moving forward, but oh, there we go. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, so material efficiency in the steel sector can be achieved through actions on both the production and consumption side. Uh, on the production side, the, this can involve light weighting, um, improving yields, uh, using scrap and recovering scrap better, as well as optimizing the design of final products. On the consumption side, there are a range of options available, um, generally uh, aiming to prolong longevity and use of, of steel related products. And initi initiatives like the EU's Eco Design um, Directive can contribute towards this, uh, for example, in the debate over right to repair and also the extension to include embodied carbon emissions. So consumer facing options include schemes like car sharing and also um, libraries of things. So whilst there are many estimates in the literature of potential emission savings by material efficiency, many contain endogenous assumptions around other technologies that would also be in place. And so to avoid uh, double counting these technologies, we selected the following high level estimates of potential reductions to final demand through material efficiency in the UK. Um, and so this is clearly, there's clearly a, a considerable range in the uh, estimated potential from material efficiency strategies that can be achieved um, up to about 38% reduction by 2050. And so here I've presented the results of the technology scenarios at the central ambition level and here you can see that only the retrofit scenario achieves reductions in line with the core CCC budget and no scenario achieves the further ambition budget. And I should note that in our scenarios we assume a constant level of final demand for steel in the UK um, the literature does indicate that in the short to medium term, retrofit could still remain the most feasible and effective option uh, given the long replacement cycles in the sector and also the lead times expected for commercialization of novel technologies. And this, this outcome that, that retrofit could be continuing to, to be quite significant um, could be in part influenced by a lack of understanding of the current like, rate of implementation for retrofit technologies. Um, and this is in function uh, uh, a kind of product of the lack of publicly available data on the sector. So I've now presented the results for both the technology and material efficiency scenarios um, and these show the central ambition technology scenario coupled with the 38% reduction to final demand for steel by 2050. Um, and again the scenarios don't reach the emissions reductions required for the most stringent carbon budget. Um, but they suggest that the CCC core budget could feasibly ach be achieved by most scenarios. In practice, it's often more useful to compare the cumulative emissions resulting from the scenarios as it's this which determines whether a carbon budget is achieved. Um, and here the technology and material efficiency scenarios are colour coded by their budgetary bands um, if they want to meet. Um, and as you can see, only the high ambition retrofit and high material efficiency scenarios achieve the most ambition ambitious budgets. As a sensitivity analysis, I tested the effect of different assumptions of grid electricity decarbonisation towards 2050. And in the fuel shift scenario, which would be the most impacted um, given the amount of electrification in that process, um, assuming decarbonisation of the grid to net zero carbon intensity by 2050 reduced cumulative emissions by about 6%. Um, and there's evidently further potential um, if you're assuming an earlier date of grid decarbonisation uh, than 2050. And similarly, um, assuming earlier demand reduction via material efficiency should have larger mitigation potential than later action, um, given energy intensity is likely to be higher in the near term. And so I also carried out a sensitivity analysis of changing the demand reduction profile of material efficiency scenarios. Um, so logistic reductions to demand reduced cumulative emissions by about 7% over the linear case. And when assuming a slower rate of logistic change, um, it's, it could increase uh, cumulative emissions by up to 13%. And so this demonstrates the value of potentially earlier action on material efficiency. Um, and so I come on to our key findings. Um, and our, our conclusions were that established technologies such as retrofit could be effective in the medium term. And this is consistent with what's suggested in the literature. Secondly, um, the expected commercialisation dates for novel technologies could limit their application to reaching net zero. Um, and given our indications of the potential for remaining residual emissions in the sector, uh, some CCS capacity may still be needed. Um, similarly, we also showed that greater and earlier 
material efficiency alongside uh, technology interventions could help the sector effectively decarbonise, um, indicating that perhaps they should be given a more immediate policy priority. Um, and we similarly realised that uh, projections of future demand for steel, as well as uh, the remaining scope for um, the deployment of certain technologies and the uh, carbon budget assumed for the sector are all uncertainties in the analysis, which could be uh, further considered. And so now I'll just present a couple of questions for discussion. Um, and so the first one relates to sectoral carbon budgets. So um, given the importance of the CCC budgetary assumptions in, in how aligned the sector was with net zero, um, there'd be value, would there be value in setting divine, defined car, sectoral carbon budgets as a policy tool? Um, so would they give industry some flexibility in the measures they choose to employ to decarbonise? And could a budget effectively set a cap so that if companies grew, they would have to do so sustainably, that is, without increasing their absolute emissions? Um, and could this work in a way similar perhaps to the car corporate car target setting practices like the science-based targets initiative and their sectoral decarbonisation approach? Um, and the second question uh, relates to uh, what strategies are available to create value and market share for low carbon steel, when at the moment there are perhaps few incentives to preferentially use these products. And so could embodied carbon standards be a useful policy tool? And with the introduction of a border carbon adjustment in the EU, is there a potential that low embodied carbon steel um, could increasingly carry competitive advantage? So um, any thoughts would be really welcome and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alice, for your uh, great presentation uh, with a lot of thoughts uh, and uh, a lot of uh, also point of marks, I, I, I think. Um, uh, let's give the floor to the audience for questions, uh, Andrea. Yeah, there are already a lot of questions, so I try to keep track on everything. So the first ones are from Matthias, and he's asking, uh, of course, there is copper dilution in, in scrap, which can be used for the electric arc furnace. So this might be a major barrier. And uh, he asks you what you see of kind of hopes that this will this barrier will be overcome and in the same context he is asking so what would be a plausible share of uh, electric arc furnace production in total steel production in the future great thank you for the question um yeah so i guess um a few things to note there so one is that we it was mainly a, a sort of top-down model that we built on the steel sector so we didn't go into a huge amount of detail on the representation of, of scrap uh, particularly availability and and future constraints but uh, one thing is that the the uk is is quite a significant scrap exporter um so in i think in 2017 they exported about 8.1 megatons of, of paris scraps whereas they only they imported uh, 0.3 megatons um, so there is sort of a there's a limitation structurally in terms of how much scrap could be used given the existing kind of uh, systems of, of exports for it um, similarly there's limitations with conversion to uh, electric arc furnace production given the types of products that are typically produced in the uk um, so without being able to put a specific number on it um, it would be looking at the grade of, of steel goods that the uk typically produces and and what they might produce in the future as a that could be a particular constraint to to the potential um, I think um, electric arc furnace um, kind of production is increasingly going to be used to produce high quality long products, which could be a future direction for the UK as well. Um, and definitely it would be an extension of our analysis to consider scrap in more detail. Okay, thank you very much then. I think I just continue with the next question. And the next question has been regarding material efficiency. So do you have an idea? how much these uh, material efficiency measures cost in, in the case of the mentioned ones and how do you compare them to, to other greenhouse gas uh, reduction options? Great, thank you. Um, so we didn't explicitly in include a sort of ec economic analysis of the cost of the different options because um, we sort of focused on what, what would be a transformative scenario towards net zero. Um, with a lot of the material efficiency scenarios, there's, also, uh, the, there's often the potential for cost savings um, and, and also sort of multiple benefits around them. Um, so uh, particularly at the consumer side in, in terms of reducing costs. So whilst I won't be able to put a, a number on it, there's a number of, uh, there, are, there are a few uh, sort of good studies which would look at that in more, more detail, which I've 
Pat might have referenced in my presentation, <laughs> um, but uh, no, we didn't look at the, the specific mitigation potential of a specific strategies. It's more of a high level estimate of, of what the overarching potential could be. Okay, thank you. And then another question from Timo concerning your uh, um, analysis framework. So is this scenario only UK production based? So, or does it also consider the carbon footprint of steel consumption in the UK? Um, so the scenarios are uh, based on UK production, um, although, uh, again, over the last few decades have been significant offshoring of, of UK uh, steel demand. So I think uh, a good extension of this analysis would be to look at it um, from a consumption based perspective, perhaps in using multi regional input output modelling um, as an approach to really assess the consumption based impact of some of the changes. Um, yeah, and I think structurally it's it's it would be interesting to consider the sector more as a as an intermediary um, user of steel um, in terms of the, the trade of steel in, in general. So um, yeah, there are definitely a few areas where you could definitely expand this work. But yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, I think then that directly answers also Johan's questions as he asks, how do you account for uh, imports and exports in the model? Yeah, okay, good. And then we have a final uh, question from Reza and he's asking which database you used uh, for comparing the different scenarios. Um, so the retrofit scenario and the um, novel technology scenario were based on um, data from the usable energy database, which is, um, it was a project from the UK Energy Research Centre, um, which I think I might have referenced in the presentation. Hopefully you can find it if you, if you want to. Um, so most of the kind of technological detail um, came from that, that project, which it was a very um, kind of detailed overview of, of mitigation potentials in various industrial sectors in the UK. Um, and this potential, we um, could have perhaps updated some of the values in there, but um, I think that was beyond the scope of, it, scope of our initial analysis. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. And I know we still have one question about Simona. I do not know, do we still have time or should we skip it? Yes, quick, quick one. Okay, very quick one from uh, Markus. What could you think of approaches to make low carbon steel more popular? Um, yeah, so I think this is a really interesting question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'll be able to do it justice, but um, I think um, creating the right sort of demand pull um, kind of strategy, so uh, public procurement um, embodied carbon standards could help um, in terms of incentivizing use of low carbon steel. Um, and green steel mandates and things like that could be strategies. So I think it, it could be, um, yeah, it needs to be from a policy level, I guess, but those are some potential avenues um, for, for yeah, creating demand for low carbon steel, I think. Thank you very much, Alice. It was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, next presentation, the last one, uh, still on the material, a different material, aluminium, steel metal, but aluminium industry. Uh, and material and resource efficiency potential in the aluminium industry that will be provided uh, by uh, Dr. Felipe Toro. Uh, Felipe, the floor is yours. Can you activate your mic? Thank you, Simone. Can you hear me good now? Yes. Okay, uh, then first of all, thank you that uh, this uh, paper was accepted for this session and uh, I really enjoyed all the presentations. So thank you also for, for the whole team and the whole sharing. The name of my presentation is Material Efficiency in the European Aluminium Industry and Prospects for Increased uh, Circular Economy. And I am at the Institute of Resource uh, Efficiency and Energy Strategies in Karlsruhe in Germany. And uh, my student assistant, uh, Macarena Serda, has been also contributing to this work. So let's see if it's working. Um, There was one before, let's see if it can be shown. Now it's too fast. Uh, 
Uh, this is another presentation. <laughs> Uh, there is an agenda before that one, Abena, if you're handling these controls now. Okay, so basically what I want to talk to you or present you to today, share with you today is um, a bit on the aluminum value chain. Also the demand for aluminum in the European Union uh, and also show you some uh, initial results of, of what we have called here a material flow analysis or a first part of a material flow model for aluminium in the European 28 member states. Also talk a bit about the CO2 intensity of aluminium and uh, show you a bit on circular economy for aluminium, especially on potential, but also on measures. So next slide, please. Abena, I don't know, it seems there's a problem with my control. So the next one, uh, Abena, will be aluminum value chain. Yeah, exactly that one. Um, so basically, uh, as you may be very much aware, the aluminum value chain goes from primary sector, which is here shown on the left, to semi-finished products in the middle, including extrusions or castings or foil or rods, and to final uh, markets, which is also extrusions or, or even um, foil. So um, Basically, aluminum is a very young industry. Um, it is uh, providing a lot of their products to packaging, buildings, automotive, and other sectors. Um, besides the steel, uh, aluminum is, um, is the second place, let's say, um, mostly widely used around the world metal. The production of uh, aluminum, uh, primary aluminum, um, is currently around 60 million tons per year and it is continuing to grow in all regions worldwide. Especially growth has been um, being pushed or being uh, powered uh, by many developing countries. And currently China uh, is accounting um, for 55% uh, production and it has increased um, approximately 70% during the last 10 years. Um, this analysis is focusing mostly in, in Europe or only in Europe, but I'm bringing also this uh, global perspective or this uh, international perspective as uh, aluminum is a global commodity and is, it is traded uh, globally uh, currently. Um, and um, if, if there is any effort, I think, to, to, to talk about circular economy, aluminum is, is say, one of the best practices in increasing uh, recycling rates. Uh, another driver for demand um, and for production has been uh, the accumulation of stocks. Uh, and it's also accumulating stocks in, in the form of, of semi-finals or final products, but also you have stocks in buildings or in cars or in machinery that is available today. And uh, this demand is, is likely to grow in the future, according to several scenarios that we have also have the opportunity to, to, to review in this study. And uh, this is going to increase uh, over 350% in the coming 25 years. Next slide, please. Abena. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if we have a look at Europe um, a bit more in detail, and it's, it's just a matter of introduction, the, the, the future demand in Europe is really depending when is this market going to really saturate. Um, there are some scenarios that is currently counting around 250 kilograms per person of aluminum currently in Europe. It's a current average. There are different stocks in different countries, but this will be an appropriate um, average. And uh, it is expected to grow uh, between 400 to 450 kilograms per person until 2050. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the different uh, demand projections that exist. However, uh, what I want to highlight here is um, that um, in Europe, 
uh, this even to increase uh, the specific consumption per kilogram per person, it might only require only 1 million tons uh, per year of demand. So currently we are at 13 million tons of uh, primary secondary imported uh, aluminium demand in Europe and uh, only by increasing it in 1 million to 14 million tons per year uh, this will already uh, reach uh, 450 kilograms uh, per person which will already mean a, a quite a, a large saturation and um, <clears throat> uh, the demand for materials uh, especially from from the automotive sector uh, uh, currently this could be 75 percent or it could be in the future uh, 75 percent lower uh, due to circular economy and this is an, an important aspect i think uh, when considering the shift that this aluminum sector could also have <clears throat> um, then the next slide please Then up, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is um, our results from our uh, model. Uh, currently, we have, uh, especially here, focused on on um, let's say clarifying uh, base year like 2015 in, in European 28 countries. And here uh, you can see from from left to right uh, the production of aluminium. Uh, is displayed here in, in, in material and energy and CO2 flows. And it's uh, basically uh, from bauxite or from imports of mineral. Uh, the, uh, the first stage of production is to produce primary and uh, secondary uh, routes. So uh, currently in Europe, uh, we have 2.2 uh, millions of primary aluminum that is uh, produced in Europe. Uh, and uh, additionally, primary aluminum imports around 6.9 million tons and it's exporting uh, approximately 3.3 uh, um, million tons uh, to other countries. This is uh, less than 50% uh, of the imports. Uh, Mm, especially it is important for uh, CO2 and energy terms, uh, the CO2, uh, the, the, the primary route, which is the, the highest intensive one uh, on the electrolysis uh, process, uh, especially. And then below primary in this graph, uh, you can see in, in blue, um, the secondary aluminum production, which uh, is varying between 2.3 and 2.7 millions of tons in Europe. This includes, on the other hand, as you can see there in, in yellow, um, on the secondary axis, the imports, uh, uh, which is uh, amounting 6 million tons and, uh, sorry, uh, 2 million tons and also uh, 2 million tons, 1.6 million tons of imports and 2, point, uh, 2 million tons of exports of secondary aluminum. Until this point, I will say it is, uh, it's been quite straightforward. These uh, figures are available in, in different statistics like world metal statistics we have used or the European uh, Eurostat, Prodcom, as well as the European Aluminium or the German Aluminium uh, Association figures have helped us to uh, calibrate until this stage. However, what is coming afterwards, what uh, is coming in green or blue, from the primary and the secondary routes uh, towards, let's say, the production of semi-finished products, castings, flat roll products, and extrusions. Uh, this has been uh, quite more challenging as uh, there is uh, really much uh, less available data and uh, it also implied uh, having to interview uh, different actors in the market. So uh, for extrusions, uh, the way we have cataloged it is, is a category that is, a, let's say, a, artificial category that it contains at least rods, sections, bars, tubes, and pipes. So, so there is a large number of products behind these largest categories. Uh, the same with flat roll products, which is including sheets, strips, and foil. And uh, also castings are included aluminum alloys. And uh, another aspect that I like from, from these results is you can see it from the uh, green, uh, dark green and, and uh, light green. Um, uh, materials that are coming to the different sectors. So you can see uh, that uh, the different sectors that are uh, getting mostly input from castings is, is the automotive sectors, 
and uh, from uh, flat royal products is really giving input to different sectors like um, building and construction, the automotive sector, the consumers, the packaging sectors, etc. In addition, and I, what I think is very important also for, for the uh, circular economy aspects uh, in terms of aluminium has been to determine the gray flows, the gray flows that are coming from uh, uh, the, the last category on the right on the secondary routes. Uh, and um, there is also an import and export of scrap routes. And also this is uh, on the far right is what we call old scrap, which is coming from the final products. But then also uh, to the left, um, uh, which is coming uh, from the, let's say the production of semi-finished products. So the next slide, please. I have been announced, I, I have a bit of problem with moving the slides. So Simone, I might need a bit of more of time. Perhaps we can move to slide, the next one, please. Not the table, but the next one. Would you please put the next slide? Uh, Felipe, we can see the uh, CO2 intensity slide. It's right. Huh? Oh, it's not it's not here shown on my screen. But please go ahead. Oh. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, the main message uh, of this is how intensive uh, worldwide the production of aluminium is. Currently, it's seven, seven times higher with 18 tons of uh, CO2 per ton. In Europe, where there is a much more efficient production, but worldwide, it is very intensive in terms of emissions, especially if you are producing from coal and uh, at least 60% of aluminum production worldwide, it is from coal today. But you can see the advantage of increasing uh, then the secondary route, which is uh, only using 5% of the energy production in the next one. Then uh, if you could uh, please go to slide number, the next one. So if you're already looking at circular economy for aluminum, so basically the, the concept of circular economy is how do we make aluminum, how do we make the best use of it? How can we still optimize it further? And this, this will mean uh, increasing at the use area, but also the recycling area. Uh, and also, of course, on the production, but it means increasing the recycling even at, at the production of semi-finished products or primary products. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Felipe, we see the circular economy challenges. So talk, uh, we have, you have uh, one minute left. Okay. No more than one minute. Thank you. Close. So, um, then I will try to, to finalize it here. Um, I think um, this model is, is going to allow us to, to uh, calculate different impacts, uh, as I'm going to say it now. So currently, um, approximately between 65 to 77% is being recycling uh, globally. This gives us something between 35 to 23% uh, percentage is still open that can be reduced. Uh, and uh, there are different measures uh, how uh, this can be attained. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, higher um, uh, attention is given to, to increase of post-consumer collection. It means to, to increase these old scrap routes, which would mean then to design products that are going to be able to extract this aluminum uh, much faster. However, uh, this route is rather, is having a, a specific constraint. Uh, aluminum is currently produced today, especially for castings and even for cars or motors. Uh, they, are ha they, are, they, are, they need to be alloyed with some other products. And this already uh, put a large constraint when reusing it. It might be able to use that you reuse it once, 
but then you uh, will have to downgrade that kind of, of products. A second dynamic in the market is that uh, Europe and USA currently has uh, larger uh, stocks of uh, aluminum scrap that is being traded globally. And uh, a third um, um, important constraint would be what would be the change in the automotive industry because uh, mostly of the uh, new uh, type of uh, uh, scrap uh, recycling is coming from, from the automotive sector. And if there is gonna be a less demand of aluminum, which might be reduced to 75% less than today, uh, this, uh, this then will mean uh, there will not be enough um, um, secondary aluminum from these routes available into the markets. So um, I think uh, with these thoughts, I would like to conclude. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't show you all the slides. There was a problem with the transmission, but I'm very happy to, to discuss questions. And we are gonna keep working on, on this model and, and keep giving it to test a bit of these different kind of measures that are available uh, within, uh, within the simpler economy measures uh, and the impact this, this could have in the aluminum industry in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felipe, for your presentation uh, with uh, providing different uh, challenges, at least the future, uh, future challenges of the aluminum sector that is very important, uh, especially in different uh, uh, sectors, industry sectors. Uh, I think uh, we can uh, have a uh, uh, couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Andrea, I can see at least one. Yeah, okay. We already have two questions and I think the first one is from Matthias and partly you answered it already, but maybe I will just uh, repeat it again. So he asked how you estimate data quality. As we know, this is a lot of data you need for the material flow approach and it's not always readily available. I think you discussed this, but where do you see the biggest challenges and what would be your wish in this regard for the data situation? I mean, I think for, for the future of, of material uh, flow modeling, it is quite uh, restricted um, what is happening between producing plants, what is happening between remelting plants. This is kind of a real uh, black box. We have indications, we talked with some producers or some associations, they have some reports, especially what is collected publicly or semi-publicly, but uh, there is a huge potential for improvement there. Uh, and especially this, where, this is where uh, still there is potential to uh, improve uh, recyclability, not only in Europe, but also worldwide to, to get a bit of pioneer debt with, the, with these technologies for world, worldwide markets. And I, I think at the end, at the end consumer, um, it's been mentioned also in the steel presentation that uh, of course there is a potential if you are designing products different. And it also reminds me the eco design discussion a couple of years ago, or many years ago already, and this has improved, yeah? But it still is not really possible to have uh, estimates or, or have, let's say, really robust estimates on these uh, stocks that are kind of uh, being embedded in all these buildings or in all those cars. Uh, so this will be a second source that, that requires um, improvement. Okay, thank you very much. And then uh, you already talked about some trends and here I think is the next question relevant. So what do you think will be the most important drivers of aluminium demand in the future? So we often see the storyline that we use more aluminium than steel, for example, in the automotive industry. So in general and in different, in different sectors, what do you think are the main drivers for future aluminum demand? And is there some kind of trade-off between this more efficient demand reduction and the increased demand in other sectors maybe? Yes, I think um, you saw it in the different sectors, the major shift that is gonna come probably is gonna be from the automotive industries. However, uh, if you think of energy efficiency in buildings, uh, I will say this is one of the largest drivers that will uh, drive demand uh, to that side. 
to increase demand. However, there there is a potential to use more secondary routes, which will be like, a, 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 let's say, a more circular oriented demand. I think this is the, the cru crucial question. How can we reduce our primary uh, demand, uh, primary aluminum demand? Uh, it might also be the reduction of certain standards for certain products. And uh, I think also the packaging industry is uh, also facing, um, uh, this is an industry that is able to recover almost 100% of it and is able to reuse it. Uh, but uh, this, this is another driver for, for increased demand, um, especially, especially now also even with Corona times, people are uh, eating more home or eating, like food became also, a sector that is still uh, maintaining or even booming in some countries. Okay, thank you very much, Felipe. Let me check one more time if we have any other questions. So I do not see any new questions. So thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I know it's really interesting. I saw it before. <laughs> and then I will hand over to Simone to sum the panel up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Simon. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all presenters uh, of the session uh, on energy material e efficiency along the value chain. That is the last uh, session uh, of the panel two uh, on sustainable production towards a circular economy. Uh, it was a very interesting session. Uh, we ranged from uh, uh, cement to uh, petrochemical, uh, uh, going to the food sector, uh, steel and uh, aluminum as the last presentation. So a wide set of opportunity uh, to decarbonize the industry in different sectors. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, again, uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. Uh, uh, of course, uh, also to the people at, uh, that attended the session uh, arising uh, a lot of questions. So it, it was very interesting to uh, look at the presentation and of course at the uh, discussion at the end of each presentation. Uh, let me thank also the, uh, uh, the co-leader, uh, Andrea, thank you very much. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we will have uh, in a half an hour uh, or less than a half an hour, uh, uh, an additional, uh, 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 an additional session uh, uh, where we uh, can have uh, networking uh, uh, in, uh, of course, using uh, uh, again uh, the tools that uh, the conference provided, so Zoom and also Google. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.